Hello and welcome back. Today we are looking at Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, chapters 14 and 15, the continued education of the creature. But before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to thank all my patrons on Patreon. Thank you for all that you do to help support me in my making of videos here. And I also want to let you know, if you haven't gone over to my Patreon page yet, you should really check it out, because I have a lot of resources over there to help you in your study of literature, including guided study questions for Frankenstein. So, in chapters 14 through 15, when we last left off, the creature was hiding in a little shed attached to a cottage. And in that cottage lived a lovely little family. And the creature, by observing this family, had learned many things about the importance of family and culture and being loved, something that the creature has not yet experienced. And he's also learned a lot about language. His ability to read and speak have come from observing the family, particularly after the arrival of Safi, as we talked about last time. Safi is an Arabian woman who is in love with Felix. And so, as Felix teaches her French, the monster observes and learns as well. In chapter 14, the monster tells the story of Safi and why she is here and where she came from. I want to pause for just a moment here and reflect on the fact that there are so many layers to this book. Remember that the entire book is embedded in a letter from Captain Walton to his sister. And in that letter, he tells the story of Victor, who he finds out in the Arctic. And so Victor is telling his story to Captain Walton, who is writing it in this letter. And inside of Victor's story are other stories, such as the story of the creature, which we've seen takes up about six chapters in this book. And inside the story of the creature is the story of the DeLacy family and Safi. Layers upon layers here. And what does all this mean? Well, it's an interesting narrative device, but it also poses certain questions, like how can we know that a conversation that is heard embedded in this story is accurately portrayed from one character to the next to the next to the next, as they tell the story over and over again. Here we're hearing things that the creature heard from the DeLacy family. Anyone who's played the game of telephone knows the problem here. How can we trust that the conversations that were said in the DeLacy family have been accurately transcribed by the monster to Victor, who then accurately tells them to Captain Walton, who then tells them to his sister. There are moments throughout the book that attempt to answer this question. For instance, Victor apparently goes back over Captain Walton's notes and letter in order to correct any mistakes that he may have made. And we'll see that the monster is going to verify his own story with hard evidence in this chapter as well. All of this, of course, poses a particularly interesting problem, like how can we know for sure that we can trust the narrators here? I'm not sure this is a question that Mary Shelley really asks of us. It seems as though she expects us to more or less believe the entire story of Victor Frankenstein, even though he's clearly wrong-headed about a lot of things. We trust his story, but not his understanding of his own story. In any case, in chapter 14, the story of Safi is told again. Her father was a Turkish merchant in Paris, and for some reason he got on the wrong side of the law. The story doesn't reveal exactly why. The monster doesn't know. But he was about to be executed, and this was apparently a miscarriage of justice. Everyone seemed to think so. And Felix, seeing the injustice of this, decided to step in and become involved in this case. He decides to help the man flee because he thinks what's happened to him is wrong. And when he meets the man and conveys that to the man, the, the merchant is very, very thankful. However, when Felix meets the man's daughter, Safi, he immediately falls in love with her. And apparently the merchant wasn't all that above board because he likes to manipulate Felix using his daughter. He allows them to lead on this relationship and even promises that Felix may marry Safi but he doesn't actually intend to keep that promise. Felix helps him escape, and as they begin to cross out of France into Italy, the French government gets angry and arrests Felix's family. Felix then leaves Safi and her father and returns to his own family to face the consequences of his actions. As soon as Felix has left, the merchant betrays him and tries to escape with Safi. However, he has to leave in a hurry because he thinks he's about to be caught again. And so he leaves Safi to follow behind him. And instead of following behind, she decides to keep her oath to Felix and go marry him. And so she wanders around looking for his lost family, and finally they are reunited. 
Safi's agency here is significantly connected to Mary Shelley's understanding of feminism. Her mother, Mary Wollstonecraft, was an incredibly famous feminist who wrote The Vindication of the Rights of Women, and believed that women ought to be able to have control of their own property and be able to make their own decisions. And Safi's walking between these two worlds. There's the Islamic world that Safi would have to return to, where she would have to give up all of her rights as a woman. But she prefers to choose the Christian world, which has given her freedoms and given her the ability to choose and the ability to be with the man she loves. And this is ultimately the side that she chooses. Now, the de Lacy family is still poor, but they're much happier now that Felix and Safi have been reunited. And it seems as though things have worked out for them. But they haven't worked out quite as well for the monster, who kind of had this fantasy that he would be able to himself lift them out of their unhappiness. He's definitely happy for them, but the love between Safi and Felix also remind him of the fact that he is unloved. The monster's internal struggles intensify in chapter 15, when in the woods he discovers a satchel filled with books. There are three volumes, The Sorrows of Young Werther by Goethe, Plutarch's Lives, and Paradise Lost. And whenever he's not watching the cottagers, because they're occupied with something that he can't really participate in, he reads these books and studies them in depth. These three books are an interesting education for a monster such as he is. The Sorrows of Young Werther is this deeply romantic story about this young man named Werther who's troubled with all of these emotions and lofty sentiments, as the creature says. It also explores the romantic idea of escapism, the idea of leaving behind your life because nobody understands you, something that the monster feels very in tune with. And in the end of the book, Werther commits suicide. And so the monster reflects on the morality of suicide, as well as the concept of death, from reading this book. Plutarch's Lives, of course, is the stories of great heroes of the past, both historical and mythical, and studying it allows the creature to be able to understand nobility and heroism and morality and good versus evil, the creation of order and law versus violence and murder. But the book that has the strongest impact upon him is Paradise Lost by Milton. And we can already tell that because he's referenced the book several times in his story up to this point. Paradise Lost details the story of Satan's fall from heaven, and then ultimately mankind's fall in the garden. And so since this is a story of creation, the creature reflects on the idea of God as creator and Adam as the created. And this depiction of a loving God that loves his creation strikes the creature rather intensely. After all, he has been created, but he doesn't appear to be loved. And he also has no one to share his love with. He has no Eve to support him through life. As the creature continues to reflect in the book, he begins to sympathize more and more with the character of Satan, the one who's been cast out and who rebels and struggles in return. The creature understands deeply Satan's envy of the creation and the feeling that he is on the outside looking in. At this point, the creature realizes the significance of some papers that he's had with him this entire time since he left Frankenstein's lab. He apparently carried them with him in his clothing. And at first he didn't understand what they were, so he ignored them. But now that he's learned how to read and how to understand, he sees what they are. They are the journal leading up to his creation. Victor's writing and his plan for the creature's existence. And so now the creature actually sees how he was created and why he was created, but it still doesn't answer why he is abandoned and unloved. He wants to confront Victor and get answers from him. Why would you create me this way? Why would you make me so ugly that even you cast me out? However, as time has gone on, the creature still has hope that this family will not reject him. After all, he sees their kindness and the generosity of their spirits, not only to each other, but to the poor and needy that they encounter, those who are less known and loved among humanity. And the creature thinks, well, I'm surely worthy of love. I know I'm ugly, but I have all of these noble sentiments. Surely there's something in me worth loving, if I could just convey it to them. And so the creature comes up with a plan. Rather than reveal himself to the entire family, he thinks that he will just reveal himself first to the old man, because the old man is blind. And so as long as the man doesn't see him and just talks with him, perhaps the creature can get his message and his need through to Monsieur de Lacy. And then once he has established himself, then Monsieur de Lacy can advocate for him with the younger generation. 
And so a time comes when all of them have set out from the house and Monsieur de Lacy is left alone, and the creature finally decides this is the moment he's going to take advantage of it. He arrives in the house and begins to talk to Monsieur de Lacy, who of course welcomes him in and treats him very kindly. And he talks about how he's hoping to meet some friends of his who will help him, but he is so easily misunderstood, and he's afraid that these friends will reject him and turn them, him away. If only he could be advocated for. Monsieur de Lacy seems sympathetic to the creature, but the creature, in his hesitancy and in his concern that this go right, has taken too much time. And when he hears the rest of the family returning, rather than hide himself again, he throws himself at the feet of Monsieur de Lacy, clings to his knees, and begs for help. This goes over terribly, because as soon as the rest of the family sees this giant monster manhandling their dad, they react with terror and with aggression, just like every other human encounter the creature has had. They're terrified, and they don't have a chance to hear what's going on before they run him away. He doesn't want to hurt them, and so he runs away and hides again in the shed. But his plan has backfired rather badly. What's going to happen now that the creature's plan has fallen apart? We will find out in the next few chapters. Thanks for watching. You can click to subscribe, or to go to my Patreon page and see the resources I've got for you there, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.